It is an honor. It's a privilege to stand in your company this morning. Uh, men who uh, we are, we are, to say that we're not perfect is, is a, a absurd, a laughable understatement. We far fall short of not only God's righteous, perfect standards, we fall short of the, the standard that we place upon ourselves, the men that we wish we were. And yet, when I look out at this congregation, I see a, a bunch of men that hell is not pleased with. I see a bunch of men that are striving and hungry to put God first. That's why you're here. You truly want not just to be good fathers, but to be dads that are bringing your families closer to Christ. You want to be models and examples of what faith looks like. Brothers and sisters, let's not be held back by doubts and fears and worries about the past and the way we've done things. Instead, set our eyes on the horizon, set our eyes on Jesus Christ, and let's run. Let's drop all the encumbrance and let's just start running towards Jesus. And if you see somebody you can grab along the way, and if we can bring our family along the way or at least set an example on the ridge, let our kids see where we're going. And let them see us do it with diligence and persistence Encourage. Dads, it's a holy call. Bring your families closer to Jesus and don't stop. Keep going. It's been said that in life it's not important where you're coming from. What matters is where we're heading. Leaving behind all that holds us back and centering our eyes on Jesus Christ. Let's go forward. Wherever we were last year, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it doesn't matter compared to where we've set our hearts, where we've set our affection, where we're going today. And don't be ashamed that your life is changing and you're growing closer to Jesus. Let that be a testimony. God's shown me God's revealed to me, I've humbled my heart, and I'm more hungry for this than I ever have been before. And let your families see that. Where are you going, brothers, sisters? Where are you going? And I'm encouraged when I look around and I see people growing, people learning to say, I'm sorry, people learning to say, I blew it, people learning to say, the Lord first, nothing else. That blesses my heart. That encourages me. People willing to change, alter their course, listen to the Holy Spirit. Today in the book of Matthew, we're going to be looking at another man. The writer of the gospel, the apostle Matthew. Across the world, he's known as an apostle. Matthew is known as a man of God. But he didn't start that way. His journey started in one place. It ended in another uh, he ended close to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let it be our passion. Wherever our path is meandered, wherever we've gone in the past, we want to walk with Jesus. We want our lives to end in step with God. That's very encouraging to me. That's, that's part of the beauty of grace. Grace. When we're doing well in life, and, and when we know the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags, we know we're not perfect, we know that. But when we're doing well in life, and we're making some right choices, and we're avoiding some persistent sins, and we're being kind and gentle to the real person around us, we're being less hard on people, and, and we know we're walking with the Spirit, uh, you know we do that by the power of God, we do that in grace. But there's another side of that coin. When we sin and we're so shocked and upset with ourselves and, and we can't, oh, what's wrong? You know what? We believe that God transcends time, right? When Jesus hung there on the cross, he died for all of our sins. And when we prayed, maybe some of us prayed with tears in our eyes, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, God. I've been going the wrong way with my life. And Lord, forgive me. I want... And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, that day, guess what? He already knew the future sins that you would have, and he still said, come here, I love you. 
and he grabbed you and he embraced you, already knowing the times when you'd fail him and let him down and let yourself down. So this is encouraging to me. Very, very encouraging that Matthew's life started in one place and it ended close to Jesus. And we have our ups and downs. But because of grace, we're free. We don't have to pretend. We don't have to come to church and put on a false mask. We don't have to pretend like we're perfect because we're saved on our knees and there's no reason to ever get up off our knees. Let's stay humble. I'm saved by grace and I today walk my Christian life in grace. So before we get going to Matthew, there's a, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. Before we get going there, there's a couple other scriptures that just really spoke out to me in the context of Father's Day and, and uh, baby uh, Nehemiah's dedication, looking forward to his future and his walk. And, and thinking about Matthew and the way his life started in one place and ended in another. And I was thinking about scriptures that are encouraging. And I thought of Philippians 1.6, For I am confident, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, we come as we are. We don't polish ourselves up first to become a Christian. We come before God and say, Lord, I'm inadequate. Lord, I am a sinner. I, I need that cross. I need you to, to forgive me, Lord. And we come to God confessing our sins. And God grabs a hold of us and he gives us a promise that he's not going to let go until we're like Jesus Christ himself. He's going he's to erase that selfishness from our hearts. And each day we walk with Jesus is another day we're saying yes to God and no to ourselves. And someday, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we'll stand in heaven and all the guilt and the stuff behind your eyes that goes on that nobody sees, we're going to be totally free of it. And we're going to be able to say, Hallelujah, I love you, God, and I'm free from my selfishness. I'm free from my anger and my bitterness and my unforgiving heart. I'm no longer the person I used to be. And God's given us a promise. The same God who, who prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus Christ what would happen in Christ's life, the same God who on earth said, I'm going to die in three days later, I'll rise again, and then he did, the same God who rose up from the grave to prove he can keep his promises gives you and I this promise that as messed up as we are, he's not going to give up on us. He's not going to finish until he's perfected his work. He's going to complete his, his work in our lives. And so I take encouragement from that. I don't take encouragement from my roller coaster life. I don't take encouragement from the fact that I'm not the man that I wish I was. Because I wish I was really, really good. I wish I wasn't selfish. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. And in Romans 14, 1 through 4, Now accept the one who is weak in faith. Accept the one who is weak in faith. But not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Don't bring him to church just so you can judge him. One person has faith that he can eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. As somebody who's a carnivore, I kind of like that. <laughs> but, but look it, we're not supposed to judge one another. The one who eats is not to regard the rabbit, I mean the guy who eats vegetables, with contempt. The one who does not eat meat and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. So each person in the conviction of their own heart is coming to different conclusions there. Who are you? And here's what I was getting at. Who are you to judge the servant of another? How can you judge another man's servant to his own master? He stands or falls and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. Did you get that? Find encouragement there. You feel like, I'm so weak sometimes. I'm never going to stand. I'm never going to be the Christian I want to be. Well, when normally we take this passion we focus on, don't judge one another, right? That God will take care of. We're all servants of God, and we can't judge another servant. We're all servants of the Lord. 
But the point I want to emphasize here is God's laying down the gauntlet. He says, don't judge that person over there. Yeah, they're messing up. They're going to stand. And then God says, and I know they'll stand because I'm going to make them stand. And we are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, forgiven and accepted and loved, not because of who we are. Because you get saved where? On your knees. We don't get saved right into heaven on a white horse saying, look at me. Look at all I've done. Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. All right, Matthew chapter 9. And uh, we're just going to go 9 through uh, 13 today. This is uh, autobiographical. It's interesting that Luke, uh, who was uh, like a detective, uh, he researched everything, interviewed everybody. In his gospel, he gives a little bit more detailed account of this, but uh, we'll save that for when we get to Luke. But uh, Matthew, perhaps in humility, kind of gives an abbreviated account of it. And this is the writer saying how he came to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we'll read through it together uh, one time, and then I'll, I'll take it apart a little bit. The calling of Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. So Matthew's sitting there doing his business. In those days, the tax collector, his job was to collect taxes for the Roman government, and he would earn his salary by taking a little extra. He was allowed to take a little extra. But everybody knew that the tax collector, with the power of the Roman government behind him, uh, often took more than was his fair due. And so here's a man, uh, like many tax collectors, who was cheating people. He was taking more than he's supposed to, and under threat of Roman, I mean, he was a scary guy. It was uh, like extortion. Pay me. You pay, pay Caesar. Oh, you don't want to pay? I'm going to bring Caesar. See those Roman soldiers over there? I'm going to bring them down on you and your family. He was not a pleasant person. And Jesus, God in flesh, comes to him and he looks at him. And this is the, the eyes of a sinless man. This is a man who's never sinned. This is a man whose motivation is love. Who, not only motivated by love, the Bible says God is love. And he looks at Matthew, and Matthew melts. Matthew encounters Jesus, and his life is set on a different course. He just totally changed. Jesus says, follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. And this is Matthew writing, <laughs> writing his own story. Jesus came over, and he said, follow me. And I got up, and I followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So you have Jesus and his disciples, and you have the tax collectors and, and the wicked, the dregs of society, some nasty folks, some bad people. These were Matthew's friends. That's why it's natural for them to be there. So Matthew brings his friends, and they mingle with his new friends and, and mingle with Jesus. But there's other people watching, and maybe they were there at the meeting because Matthew was a rich person, I'm not sure, but, or maybe they heard about it, it's hard to say. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Pharisees, very religious people. By the way, they, the Bible doesn't argue with them. The Bible says they were sinners. <laughs> There's a bunch of bad people in that room. So the Pharisees were right when they said that. Why is your teacher eating with all those nasty people? And the Bible never says, oh, no, 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 these were the good people. No. The Bible actually said it before they did. So they were correct. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. But you guys, get out of here. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He's quoting from Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come. And think about this. From the beginning of the universe, rolling on all the way down through creation till that moment, God in flesh, 
the one who made a trillion galaxies with a trillion stars in each one, God in flesh standing in the presence of these people says, I have not come to call the goody two-shoes. I have not called, come to call the righteous. Why? Because the Bible says there are none righteous, not even one. So if you think you're righteous, if you think you've got your act all together, Jesus said, I'm not for you. I have not come to call the righteous. God came for sinners. God came for people who have blown it. Let's turn back to Matthew 9.9. 9. As Jesus went out from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Uh, Christ found Matthew busy. He was not a lazy man. He was not uh, uh, laying back, letting the government take care of him. Uh, he was busy. He was in the marketplace. He had a, a place in society. Again, maybe that's why the elite, like the Pharisees, could have been at that party with him. Uh, Christ uh, found him busy in the marketplace. He had a lucrative career. He was doing well. Is this person successful? The average person would said, oh, yeah, he's successful off of our backs, but he's successful. He's a businessman. He's got his act together. You know, I don't know how much to make of this, but uh, Matthew Henry said, uh, idle hands are the devil's play shop. But here he was in gainful employment, and he was able to find the Lord. I don't know if you can make too much out of that, uh, but it's something to think about. So his life is going well externally. On the outside, it looks like he has his act together. And Christ is audacious. Uh, Christ is, uh, well, I mean, this is just downright bizarre from a human point of view. Perhaps, uh, perhaps even unfair. Christ walks over to him, calls him to drop your plans, drop your business, drop the project you're in the middle of, utterly change your life and follow me. I want to ask you a question. Who does Jesus think he is? God? Well, this is the God we worship. He'll walk right up to you and say, you're all about popularity. I'm not in the high school. You're a cheerleader. You're the you know what? I've got different plans for you. I'm not saying you can't be a cheerleader, basketball player, whatever. What's your priority? I need to be popular. I need to be the most liked person. God says, I've got something bigger for you. I've got something better for you. I need to have the best education. Education's a good thing. Gainful employment, good things. Christian, go out there and make a lot of money. Use it for the kingdom of God. However, Jesus Christ will come right into your face and say, What's your priority? What are you living for? Is your life wrapped around your education so that it stresses you and works you over and messes you up? I've got something better for you. I've got something bigger for you. Is, is, is your whole thing just finding ways to relax and enjoy yourself? I've got to take it easy. I've got, I, I've, I've got to just it's kick back and enjoy it. God, are you wasting your life? God says, I've got something bigger for you. Get up! off that couch, away from that television, get out and follow me. And it doesn't matter how important you think your work is, your job is, if it's not done for the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, God himself, who knows each of those trillions upon trillions of stars by name, the Bible says, who knows every hair on your head before and after you shower, this God loves you and cares about you and said, don't waste your life. Follow me because I've got something bigger. Now, for many of us, that will still be the plumber, but now we're going to be the Christian plumber. We're still going to be the athlete, but now we're going to be an athlete who uses our platform for Jesus Christ. See what I'm saying? Follow me out of emptiness. File, file, follow me into meaning. And God is audacious. He's bold. And he's not shy about saying, my way's better than your ways. And your way will lead to everlasting destruction. And my way leads to peace and joy and life and hope and happiness. And so God calls us, just like he called Matthew. 
God places an unreasonable call upon your life. Unreasonable from a human point of view. The things your parents want you to do, God may have different plans. The things your friends all think you should be doing, God might have different plans. The pressure of society, and each generation is different, is going to push you one way, and God says, you don't really want to go that way. I've got something bigger. I've got something better for you. Be a part of my agenda. Be a part of my plans. God is unreasonable. C.S. Lewis called him the great interferer because he'll sit on your shoulder and say, no, no, no. Listen to me. I've got something big, something beautiful, something wonderful, a life of love. The world is fallen. It's sin sick. It's often vampiric. Have you ever thought about that? Like a vampire is a metaphor for sin and selfishness, fallen humanity. What does a vampire do? Well, he stays alive by sucking the life out of other people. And our world often functions that way. I get ahead as a salesman if I cheat somebody. I can become more popular by gossiping about that person or putting them down. I can get an edge by standing on somebody else's head and pushing them down so I can climb up. And it's all that vampire is just a metaphor for fallen humanity. And God says, no longer are we going to live for self. And that's why he came and gave himself and died upon the cross so we could see that there's a better way and so that his death could cover all of this nastiness that we're all guilty of. God always has and he always will be unreasonable from the world's point of view. Business first. Pleasure first. Neither of those things jive with Jesus first. God first. God's economy is different than the world's economy. He trades in a different currency. His currency is forgiveness. His currency is mercy. His currency is love. He says, make yourself rich with these things. Put God first. Either we're going to have an eternity with the Lord or we're going to have an eternity apart from the Lord. And Christ said, be careful where you're placing your treasures. Are you going to build your treasure into things that rust and decay and get old and fade? He who dies with the most toys wins. No, he who dies, dies. We know, we know that every piece of clothing we wear wears out. The law of cause and effect, entropy. Everything falls into chaos. Everything falls apart. Everything gets old. I, I just turned 45 last month. Uh, I can feel it. Where are you going to bet your soul? Jesus Christ said, the get, person who gets everything in this world and loses his soul, what has he gained? It's like going to the racetrack. You go to the racetrack and you get to bet on a horse. And, you, you, and you're just going to put everything you've got there. And so Deb's not here today, so I'm going to use Frank as an example. And so Frank, and by the way, Frank would not do this, but Frank uh, says, you know what? I'm just going to let everything ride today uh, because you only live once. And so he, he's going to the racetrack and he sees a horse over there. It's number seven and it's limping. It's got a bad leg. He said, oh, I've got a good feeling about this. And so he, he goes up to the, the ticket booth or whatever, the counter and says, I'm going to give everything I've got. In fact, here's, here's my home, here's my car, here's everything I've got. I'm letting it ride on number seven. I kind of look around because he's feeling good about it. And so they, they get to the starting line, and, and he's feeling good, he's feeling good, and, and it's, the horses are off, the, the gun goes off, and number seven's stumbling. N number seven doesn't win. If you know... You can't take your success in this life with you into eternity. It's like betting on number seven. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my life on popularity. I'm going to put my life and have a lot of friends. Oh, but I already know that doesn't work. Don't gamble everything on a horse with a broken leg. We already know what isn't going to work. How are you going to get to heaven? How are you going to get into eternity? If I become a really good athlete, maybe? Wait, how am I going to jump that high? You know? 
if I, if I make enough money in my bank account, and then when I'm dead, I, wait, no, that doesn't work. All these horses with broken legs, and yet we gamble our lives upon them. God trades in different currency, and he calls us to be a part of his plan, his agenda. Christ called, and Matthew knew this was a call he should obey. He heard the voice of Christ, and he knew deep down he should obey, and, and he had a choice before him, uh, like the choice Dad was talking about that Nehemiah has. See, God honors you and respects you and loves you. God's given you this incredible, incredible amount of uh, responsibility. He lays before you a choice to be with him or to walk away from him, to choose eternity or to choose eternity apart from him, to choose forgiveness or to say, no, I'm going to earn it myself the old-fashioned way. Of course, I already know my life's messed up. I already know I'm not perfect. I already know I fall short of my own standards, let alone Lord's. And Jesus Christ says, come unto me, everyone who's weary, that life's just beat you up and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and I will forgive your sins, and we will eat together, and we will walk together, and we'll do life together. Matthew heard this call. Many of us in this room have heard this call. Many of us in this room have obeyed that call. But maybe some of us have heard the call. And we've heard it again. We've heard it again. There's a danger that each time you hear in disregard, it gets easier. Brothers and sisters, Matthew heard that voice. He got up and he changed his life. Uh, don't bet on a horse with a broken leg. Listen to this call and say yes to God. He's the one who made you. He's the one who loves you. He died for you. Just say yes to God. Yes, okay, I give up. I'm not going to fight with you anymore. Where has it gotten me? I'm going to find my identity not in rejecting you. I'm going to find my identity in being another person who's been saved and forgiven. I don't want to put myself in a box. I don't want to put God in a box. Christ called. Matthew knew it was God. He knew it deep down inside. And he got up. And he followed. He dropped everything and followed Jesus. Today I ask you, uh, what do you need to drop? Even Christian brothers and sisters, what do you need to drop in order to more fully follow Jesus Christ? What are you holding on to? What's keeping you back? Here's an even more personal question. Have you ever felt like Christ has been calling you to make him the priority in your life? And you've been kind of not saying no, but you're kind of pushing the pause button. You're trying to put him on hold. I, I don't really want to answer that right now, trying to push the call off. Well, that's between you and the Holy Spirit, but think about that. Let's look at, at uh, 9. Mm, I'm sorry, 9, 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, so Matthew met Jesus, so what does he do? He invites him into his house. He brings him into who he is, his, his, his life, his relationship. And he doesn't try to keep that secret. I'm a Christian now, but I don't want my old friends to know about it. Or what will they think? He brings Jesus into his life, and it's just natural that his old friends are right there. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Jesus having dinner. Remember we saw that uh, last week. In, the, in Genesis, we saw God walking with Adam in the cool of the day. Taking a walk with God in life, doing life together. And then at Revelation, the end of the Bible, we see Jesus said, I'm knocking at the door to your heart. Open up and I'll come in and we will eat together. It's about relationships and God saying, let's do this together. And so Christ comes and he does what Christ does. He joins Matthew for a dinner in uh, doing life together. Intimacy, this is a picture of relationship. Matthew has his old friends there to meet his new friends. Matt, theologian Matthew Henry points out that those who are brought to Christ cannot but desire that others also might be brought to him. Amen? You know Jesus and you're thinking, wow, this is too good. My, my family needs to know this. My friends need to know this. So when we really experience God in our lives, it makes an impact. We can't go away unaffected. And God makes this impact in our lives. And we say, 
I've got to let all my buddies know about this. I've got to let all my friends know about this because this is life. It's like one beggar telling another beggar where he found some, a, 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 a banquet. Come on. It's good. Come on into church. Come with me. And we share our faith with those around us. Now let's look at 11 through 13. When the Pharisees, these are the, the religious elite, uh, religious conservatives of their time, they took the scriptures very seriously. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now you know what? I kind of like it when the Bible calls it as it is, when Jesus says you're a sinner. And, but these guys who are being critical and judgmental are kind of uncomfortable with the way they say it, aren't you? The way they say that. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And you guys don't know how sick you are. But go and learn what this means. Get out of here and think about this, fellas. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous. I came for sinners. So we, we often, when you hear about religion, the way the, how does the world see religion? The world does not understand Jesus. The world does not understand. They're rejecting something. They don't even know what they're rejecting. So the world thinks, well, you have, you have to be a Christian. You have to be really polish yourself up and, and be really good or at least think you're really good. But we know they're all hypocrites. So, so to be religious, you have to first be really good. Then you can be religious. And Jesus says the first step you need to have is to know you're a sinner. The first thing is to know how much you need a Savior. I'm sin sick. I need a physician. See how the world sees religion? See the way God sees faith? Totally different. And oftentimes I'm speaking with people and they're rejecting something and I'm thinking, yeah, I'd reject that too. But that's not what the Bible says. What you're rejecting is not what the Bible has revealed to us. Don't believe what the devil's selling. Don't buy it. So what we see with Jesus and then Matthew bringing in his friends to meet Jesus and his other followers, disciple, that's relationship. What we see in the Pharisees, this is a picture of religion, human, human religion. And today's sermon is entitled, Another Blow Against the Religion of Self-Righteousness. Uh, uh, against the Religion of the Self-Righteous. And that's what we've seen uh, through Matthew, this entire book. God keeps going after this idea that we can be self-righteous. What does self-righteous mean? The idea that, well, I'm doing pretty good myself. I don't need God. And God goes after that again and again and again because, now, you know, God goes, says prostitution is a sin, a murder is a sin, lying is a sin. It's all throughout the Bible. But God's going after this idea of self-righteousness because it keeps us off our knees. I'm doing pretty good. I'm glad Jesus died for those people. I think uh, God and I have got it worked out. You know, self-righteousness will keep us out of heaven. And self-righteousness also can keep me from being a good repenter. And every Christian should be a good repenter. We're saved by grace. We walk by grace. If I'm in step with the Holy Spirit, God's continually correcting my course. Continually. God is an infinite God. No matter what progress I've made in my life, and let's be honest, we've made a lot of progress from where we started. We beat ourselves up, but you're not the person you were 10 years ago. You're not the person you were last, last year. God, if we're putting our faith and walking with Jesus, we're growing. It's like climbing the face of a mountain, right? It looks the same, looks the same, and you, oh, and you slide down a little bit, and you climb up, and you slide down a little bit. And you, uh, how many years of climbing and sliding do I have to do? And you look over your shoulder, and you say, wow, God's brought me some ways, hasn't he? God has brought me some ways. But no matter how far we grow, God's an infinite God. We, can't, we always have room for more growth. So we always have room to be corrected by the Holy Spirit. We always have room to keep growing as long as we're humble and keeping ourselves uh, open to the correction and direction of the Holy Spirit. So human religion, and we're all tempted to think this way, myself included, is the sinful, sinful soul's way of dressing up pride and then putting a religious stamp of approval on it. Human religion, every, other, every religion on the planet, and Christianity, when we're not listening to the Holy Spirit, but it becomes rote and ritual and routine, every religion starts to make us feel pretty good about us. And we're better than people in that country, and we're better than those people. Human religion 
glorifies self. God's religion has us on our knees before the one who gets all the glory. Do you see the difference? And Christianity can look just like every cult and every religion out, of, out there. It can look just like Islam when we make it about glorifying ourselves, how good we are, instead of how good and merciful and wonderful the Lord is. Don't dress up ourself, ourselves and put some religious drapes on it and think now we're good enough. The point of the cross, brothers and sisters, is we are not good enough. The cross is an offensive thing because it says you'll never be good enough. You need grace. You need God himself to give himself to pay for your sins. And either we come before God and say, I need that cross. I need that grace. Lord, forgive me. Or we walk in our own strength, which is not strength at all, and we're betting on that horse with a broken leg. Two choices, two paths in lives. Sisters, brothers, today, today, Matthew heard that call. He got up and followed. Today, you know it's God inside. Get up. Follow. Don't leave him behind. Jesus, again, just like, remember the Sermon on the Mount, again, he blasts human self-righteousness. Jesus is talking with and spending time with people the world would write off. The world would look down on them because Jesus is all about love. Jesus doesn't write off people. They're too ugly. They're too smelly. They're too poor. They're too sinful, even. Jesus doesn't write people off that you and I are quick to write off because we're so awesome. And meanwhile, our, little, our planet is like a speck of dust in this giant universe, and we're specks of dust on the planet, and we're too important and too big for other people. And meanwhile, God, who created it all, comes down, becomes one of us, and dies for the people that we're looking down on? Tell me how that makes sense. Tell me how that attitude is not offensive to heaven. Jesus is about love, and I want to be. His priority is loving people, and I want that to be true of me, and it's my sin that keeps pulling me back. And that's why Jesus is all about calling people repentance. Turn from your wicked ways. Leave this wicked generation, this doomed generation, and come to me. Come to me. Because God's ways are more beautiful, and they're better than our ways. And brothers and sisters, we need to do it. You need to, we need to do it to become a Christian. As Christians, we need to do it repeatedly to get ourselves right with the Lord. And we need to be desperate to grab a hold of the people we love and maybe the people we have a hard time with and, and, and say, God, help me to love this person so that we can move them close to you. Because there's going to be a party in heaven. And the more people there, the better it's going to be. In God's economy, tell me one good reason why we shouldn't be hungry to share the gospel with others. That's what I thought. Jesus tells the Pharisees, because he's always calling us to repentance, Jesus tells the Pharisees he didn't come to befriend the righteous, self-righteous, right? Because the fleshly religion of self-righteousness is ultimately anti-God, it's anti-love, it's a religion of self, it, self sets, it sets self up as the measure of goodness, and since I determine what's right for me, I don't need to repent. I don't understand people who say, I would never change anything in my life. But if you walked closer with Jesus, you'd want to change a lot of things. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, saves his strongest language, not for atheists, they're lost, but for religious people who outwardly have their acts together, but on the inside haven't gotten real with God. They haven't set down their pride. They've never been broken by their sin and felt the need of a Savior. Remember? At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, people are going to come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, we did all these religious things in your name. He's going to say, depart from me. I didn't know you. There was no relationship there. Romans 3.23 tells us that we're all sinners. This is the reality. This is the world we live in. The Pharisees didn't get that yet. Let's not be religious. And what we're really worshiping is our culture or ourselves. We can be religious and worship Christianity without worshiping Christ. I, I don't mean true Christianity. I mean 
cultural Christianity, right? Brothers and sisters, the Sermon on the Mount was, was Christ's first recorded sermon. Now think about that. Christ's first recorded sermon. So if you believe God set time in motion 6,000 years ago, that time began 6,000 years ago, or, or, uh, or that uh, and in this sermon you believe that God waited for uh, 6,000 years to give this sermon, if you believe that God created the universe much longer ago than that, then you can marvel that all this time passed so that God could become in, could come in flesh, that the universe was set in motion so God could give this message. Think about that. First recorded message of God on earth, and what does he have to say? Well, we've talked about this word blessed. Remember it meant fortunate or lucky or happy. God comes to earth, and he looks you in the eye. Jesus came down. He, he sat down on that mountain. There was all the people gathered, and he starts off. What does God have to say? Remember what we said? Here's how to be happy. God comes into our world and says, here's how to get how to be one of the lucky ones, to be one of the fortunate ones. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. God's first message he really wants this world to get, you have to understand you're spiritually bankrupt. Understand you're a sinner, that you've been broken by sin and selfishness. Blessed, happy is the person. Lucky is the person who gets this, that knows I'm messed up. I'm profoundly, deeply broken and bruised in my soul. I can be so hard-headed. I can use language. God gave me the gift of language so I could praise him, so I could sing to God, and I use this language to dump on people, and I can be so hard and critical and angry and abusive. And God says, understand your brokenness. If you do, you're going to be lucky. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be fortunate. Blessed are the meek. Because when we understand we're spiritually broken, guess what? That makes us humble. We get off the high horse and we start putting our arms around people. Instead of saying, lead me, follow me to Christ, we say, come with me to Christ. Blessed are those who, who mourn that we're broken up for our sins. I, why did I treat people like that? Why am I like this? And we're not happy. We, 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 a lie may, sits uncomfortably in our soul. Bitterness it is, 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 is uh, the light of God and his goodness is coming in. And we don't want that bitterness. We don't want that darkness, that nastiness in our hearts anymore. And Jesus says, if you mourn your sin, you're blessed. Be upset with your nastiness. Don't, don't excuse it. Don't say it's okay. We're all human. We're all so No, it's not okay. If it was okay, Jesus wouldn't have died to pay for that sin. It's a big deal. Blessed are the meek again, the humble. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for goodness because they will be filled. So when you hunger and thirst for goodness, that's not somebody saying, I'm pretty good. That's somebody saying, oh, I want to be a better person. Oh, Lord, please fill me with your goodness. and Be hungry for that. Desire that. And God says... God says, if that's your passion in your life, you want to be just like Jesus, you want to be a good person, he says, I've got good news for you. If, if your heart just breaks because of your sin and you want to be good and you're living your life, you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, God says, you will be filled. Brothers and sisters, that's good news. That's what we started off with these words of encouragement. God's going to finish this good work in my life. And when I'm upset with myself because I don't like the way I've been thinking or acting or treating people, or maybe just had the wrong priorities for, for a week or two or a little while, when I'm upset with myself and I feel, oh, Lord, I'm just hungry to be a better man, Jesus says, you know what, Dan? You're going to be filled. You're going to get that. Be hungry for me. Be hungry for goodness. Don't be content with the way the world does things. Don't excuse yourself. Be hungry for goodness, and you will be filled. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we feeling well-fed? Are we feeling content with our own goodness? Or do we hunger and thirst to be more like Jesus? Jesus is more concerned about loving people than with appearances. J. Vernon McGee, great Bible theologian writes, Jesus is the great physician 
He came to heal mankind of their basic problem, which is sin. This ought to be said. This ought to be said to a lot of our little Christian groups who have banquets and fellowship meetings. And do not invite the unsaved. If the unsaved do come, the majority of these Christians freeze them out anyway. May I say to you that I think some of these so-called Christian groups are sinful in their very existence and in the way they meet today. Jesus Christ was all about welcoming in. And we can set up human institutions that are all about excluding. I told you, I went to a church once where just to be in the church, they quizzed me about my salvation. They came up to me and talked to me. They decided, okay, he's probably saved. So he allowed me to sit in, this, in, the, in the church service. Why wouldn't you want an unsaved person to come and hear about Jesus Christ? And then they had a meal together, but I couldn't eat with that because I wasn't part of their group. So it's like anti-church growth. <laughs> uh, Jesus Christ was about welcoming people in and eating with people. And too often, we don't do that, but too often you can say, oh, look at them, they're different. They don't know the way we do things here at Foundation. I'm not saying we do that, but I mean the temptation is there. And a new person comes, and why are they eating by themselves? <laughs> Everybody else looks really happy talking about sci-fi movies or whatever, as we tend to do here. Everybody else looks like they're really enjoying it. says, why are the new people all by themselves? So uh, J. Vernon McGee says, that's just sinful at its very core. Jesus Christ was reaching. It wasn't about the meal, do you understand? Jesus Christ was at the meal to bring people, to love on people, to bring them close to Jesus. Uh, and we should think of our lives and our banquets and our parties that way. Let's mix our unsafe friends with our safe friends, get them all together, see if Jesus rubs off on them, love on people. There's another warning, though, that we need to make. Please listen to this, because churches either usually go all the way one way or all the way another way. You know the thing about Christian life? It's almost always a tightrope walk, and you've got to balance. And, and so, well, we're not going to be judgmental, and we're just going to accept everybody and never be critical. And, and, and then other churches say, oh, no, we can't have sin. And, oh, look at those nasty, dirty people. And, and Jesus Christ walked the straight and narrow. And God, Jesus called people to repent. He didn't say, oh, you're fine. Don't worry about that. He says, you've got to repent. You better come to me. He called sin, sin. The Bible says they were sinners. But he loved on them. And he was perfect. How should imperfect people like you and I put our little butts on God's throne and start being critical and judgmental of other people? So the warning is, these so-called Christians that say with a self-righteous air, self-righteous, I, I would not consider myself too good to hang out with sinners. I'm not like those hypocritical Christians that look down at sinners uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more spiritual than that. I do hang out, uh, I do hang out with, with people whose lives are messed up. I can't stand to be around Christians. I don't call these folks I hang around with to repentance. No, I don't want to offend them. I just want to be there to encourage them. Uh, I don't know if you could say I'm salt in life, really. Every once in a while I get to say something, kind of, but I don't want to offend them with my religion. Uh, I hang around with unsaved people, because anyways, I'm more comfortable there with, than with religious people at church. Uh, people who take their faith seriously and really are repenting and saying they want to be different, uh, that's not really where I'm at yet. Not really ready for that. Uh, I eat with people and hang around with people, but instead of calling lost people to repent, instead of asking them to fall on their knees before the living God, I just find a lot easier just gossiping with them about the boss or uh, complaining about them with other people. And uh, yeah, I guess you could say I'm not really any spiritual help to them, but I don't look down at them. Uh, and they probably have more of an influence on me than I have at them. So I think God approves of that, right? Because I'm not being judgmental. No, you've fallen off on one side. And it's just as bad as a person who's fallen off of the other and they're so hyper, hypercritical and negative towards everybody. Jesus Christ said, let's be honest about the truth. Love people. Spend time with people that the world writes off in order to bring them close to Jesus. And let's not fall off one way or the other. Uh, there's something else here that I want to 
take a brief look at, just in case someone is thinking, you know what, I'd plan to give a short message because it's Father's Day. <clears throat> Moving on. Uh, there's something else here I want to take a look at. Uh, just in case someone is thinking, uh, I think Dan's pushing that religion versus relationship thing too much. Well, then you weren't listening the last few years. But if you're thinking Dan's pushing that religion versus relationship a little too much, this section, Jesus says, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. Remember I said it's from Hosea 6.6? 6. He's quoting the prophet Hosea, who's speaking for God, and he wrote, God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. See, these people that Christ is talking to, they were doing the religious thing, just like Hosea was talking to a culture that outwardly was very religious, doing the rituals, doing the traditions, but their heart was not in it. And God says, I want something real. I want your heart. And just two verses before that, two verses before the words quoted by Jesus there in Hosea 6, 6, so in Hosea 6, 4, God says to the people that were outwardly very religious, he said, now listen to God's heartbreak. He said, your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. That's the religion of self-righteousness. That's the dead, dry, ritual-driven religion that's all about making ourselves look good and feel good because we're doing religion but we haven't humbled ourselves and we've never fallen in love with the one who gave his life for our sins. God says, your love, because I want you to love me, it just, it's gone. It's like a mist in the morning. The sun comes out and it's gone. And God's heart breaks because God wants a relationship. God's not interested in empty religion, in empty ritual. God wants your heart. It's like being married to somebody and doing all the right things, but you don't really love them. They're going to see through that. God all the more so. We can't fool God. God wants my heart, all of it. God wants your heart, all of it. Now, I don't want my love to be like the dew that disappears in the morning. Jesus said he came to call sinners, not to self-righteous. Dan, brothers, sisters, if you can't hear God's call, if I can't hear it, maybe it's because I'm too content with myself. He said, I'm calling sinners. I don't hear nothing. That's a bad place to be. I want to hear God calling me to someplace better than I'm at right now. If I'm unwilling to change or repent, I become spiritually deaf and I can no longer hear the Lord. I want to hear Jesus. So I start with understanding I need Jesus. And then he says, Dan, come here. And he said, yes, Lord, I'm coming. And we answer from the depths of our heart, I've heard the call. I heard it before and I didn't answer. I heard the call today, I'm going to answer. Brothers and sisters, it's as simple as this. We're going to bow our heads right now. We're going to pray. If you've been a Christian for a long time, but maybe your life has been meandering and going this way and that, it's time to come to Jesus. It's time to get back on track. And if you're not sure you ever really repented of your sin and said, my ways are screwed up, God, I need you, do that this morning with me. We're going to pray together. In the presence of holy God, and right here today, we can get our lives back on track. Let's bow our heads and go before holy God in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, Lord, you're so good. You are good. There's not even a shadow of darkness in you. You're so beautiful, and we know, God, we, we make excuses for our sin because we know we're sinful. We try to hide it because we know it's wrong. This didn't come from 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 our culture, our messed up cultures. didn't come from our family. This didn't come from just some evolutionary process. Lord, there is goodness, and we know we fall short, and we know you are good, Lord. So today, Lord, we confess, we acknowledge how broken we are on the inside, Lord, because you are good, and we know you're not. We, we hear this music from heaven. It's so beautiful. It's so different from our sin-sick world, Lord, and we want to dance to that heavenly tune. So, Lord, today we confess our sins, each one of us, Lord, struggling with perhaps different things in different places in our lives, Lord, but we know it. We know that nastiness. We know that hard-headedness, that wickedness, that lust, that greed, Lord. And we hand it to you, Father. And if, the, if your son Jesus didn't die on the cross, if he didn't pay for our sins, then we are lost indeed. So, Father, we just want to take your word. We want to believe you and trust your promises. And you said 
you will forgive everyone who calls on the name of your son, Jesus Christ. So today, Lord, we confess our sin. We come before you in faith. We lay down our sins, Lord, and say, take us, take us completely. We hear your call today, and we say, yes, Lord, I'm coming. I will follow you. Thank you for hearing my prayer, God. Thank you for your Bible. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for your love. I want to live for you each and every day, and I don't want to hold back anymore. We love you, Jesus, but our love is so far short of where it should be. Help us to learn to love you more, and help us to learn to love each other more. God bless Nehemiah. God bless our dads. God bless our families. And Lord, help us to grab hold of you and never let go. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.